Hey, John and Mike, Brew-Dudes.com. It is now time for the culmination of my kegging project. I bought the parts, I brewed the beer, now it's time to put it all together. So let's get this kegging operation operational. Step by step, here it comes. Here it comes. Okay, so what we didn't show you, what happened off camera, was I actually racked uh, the beer that I brewed for this particular kegging experiment uh, into this. I thought you didn't need to see that. But before I even did that, made sure that I cleaned this puppy with uh, PBW. I soaked it overnight uh, just to get all the uh, soda smells. I mean, it didn't smell great when we opened it up on camera, you know, all those weeks ago. So I made sure that it was all cleaned out. We changed the O-rings. We knew that was going to be a, an issue. So when I, 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 I drained it uh, just before we turned the cameras on and I rinsed it out and then I threw in some uh, star sand to sanitize the whole thing, made sure I got the, the, uh, the top here uh, sanitized as well, and then I racked the beer into it. So we're all set with that. Now it's time to build the keg with all the hoses and uh, the fittings and the tank and all that. So I think the first thing we're going to do is hook up the gas line from the tank to the keg. So, come this way. Alright, here we've got the regulator. So the first connection that we're going to make is going off of the main supply valve from the regulator. We're going to put, this is just a threaded fitting, but we need to get a barb on here to accept tubing. So what John's got is a, um, a fitting <laughs> and, and the barb. And I like these types of fittings that all kind of nest together. It's a little more important on the um, on the disconnect side, but this makes it really easy to take something apart later. So this is kind of unique because this this part here is stainless steel, and this is stainless. So there's this little plastic, maybe nylon like compression fitting that fits onto the flare here, and then nests inside this flare to help make a good gas seal between this steel and that steel. So these just go together. I'll hold this. You can just kind of put that together. Yeah, sure. So just the barb goes inside the fitting, then you drop the little thing in there and screw it on. Okay. So then we'll we'll tighten that up off camera and make sure we have a good tight fit, but that's how we get our regulator ready for tubing. Okay, so we jammed this hose onto this barb and then we uh, took the hose clamp, tightened it on so it's not going to move at all, and I took a pair of pliers and just tightened that up on the uh, threaded uh, barb here and I think we're good to go. Now it's time to work on the other end. Okay so now we need to put this is the gray disconnect that'll go on the gas in part of the keg <coughs> just like on our regular this end is a threaded fitting and we have another uh, barb inserted into the stainless steel uh, coupler and I really like these. There are some of these plastic fittings where the barb is actually molded into the plastic and you can just go directly on here with the tubing and a hose clamp. But I like these threaded ones because if you ever want to just clean this out, you don't have to fuss around with unscrewing the hose clamp and then trying to pull the tubing off of the barb, which inevitably is really hard. And I always end up having to cut the tubing even if I take the hose clamp off. So it's really nice because you can just grab a pair of pliers and, and just unscrew this to take the tubing off if you ever wanted to clean this. So I really recommend having these threaded ones, even though they're a little more expensive than the ones that are injected and molded with the barb in it. So John's going to take this fitting and barb assembly and we're just going to put it on there. You want to tuck on? Teflon oh yeah. And then, the other thing too is you'll notice when we did the regulator in here too, we're throwing a little Teflon tape on here. I mean this is a plastic end and should nest really well against the flare inside the bar, but a little Teflon tape, it's a good insurance policy uh, for leaks. It, you know, it's probably not necessary, but I do like to just throw a couple twists of that on there, and we did it on the regulator too. It's, it just saves headaches later on, so um, just something you can do. You can skip it, and if you don't get leaks, well, good for you. <laughs> All right, great. So now we're going to jam the tubing on there with another hose clamp. Great. Okay, so we've got our gas disconnect, our ball lock gas disconnect on there with the fitting and you can see the barb inside the tubing and the hose clamp holding all together it's all nice and tight it doesn't twist and turn and now we need to put get the regulator onto our tank you can see I've put some more Teflon tape on these threads 
definitely recommend to do it here because there's a big thick threads and very critical piece you'll see uh, you don't want to lose it and maybe it makes sense to pick up an extra one just so you have it but uh, this is a nylon washer and it's got some uh, grooves in it let's see if I can focus on that but it's got some grooves in it and those grooves are very similar to the grooves there's a groove right in the see there's a a circle within the circle inside there and then there's also the same type of groove right there you can see it right here and so that nylon washer helps compress in between these two brass fittings to make a good tight seal so you're not losing gas there but again a little bit of Teflon tape goes a long way for an insurance policy so that's right we're gonna drop that right in there push it in there and then we're gonna put that bad boy right on the keg cool on the tank rather <laughs> okay so here's a little tip the regulator we've got the regulator on here thumb tight and you can see it kind of got it at a weird angle instead of it looking upright and nice like this the reason for that right now is that when we wrench down on this the whole thing is going to tighten up and as it does it's going to as we turn this it's going to naturally pull this up so you kind of have to estimate how offset you need this as you wrench down on it and I kind of like to have mine at sort of an angle like this because I'm usually usually standing higher than the tank and it's easy to see the valve so I usually just start like this we wrench down on here and the whole thing will twist into position okay so we've got our regulator in a nice position and this valve is is you know perpendicular to the flow which means that there's going to be once we open the valve there's going to be no pressure going to the line so what we're going to do first, we're going to open the valve, and you're going to see here the line pressure. The uh, so the, this is the tank pressure has come up to you know where we expect it to be usually 800 to 900 psi. So that's good. And what we're going to do now is we're going to spray with some star sand this fitting, and we're going to look for like bubbles because it's a nice foamy solution. You could use a weak you know dishwasher solution, squeeze out of a rag or something if you don't have a spray bottle. And if we see bubbles here, we know we need to tighten this up. But right now it looks pretty good, so we know we have a good fitting here. So now what we're going to do is we're going to open up this guy to allow pressure to come down the line. And then we also need to um, start to dial this up to get a little line pressure going. And so now we're at about 10 PSI in the line, and we can spray this fitting and see if we've got that tight enough and look for bubbles. Oops. And that looks pretty good, too. So... And then we'll continue right down the line. There's line pressure here. Spray this guy and see if we have leaks there. Looks good. So I think we're pretty good. We're nice and tight, so that's all good. So inevitably, at some point, you're going to find a leak and you're going to burn through a tank of CO2 and it's going to be annoying. But, <laughs> but these are the steps to try to make sure that doesn't happen to you. So the next step from here is we're going to hook this baby onto our keg and we're going to purge the keg with CO2. Sweet. Okay, so we've checked for leaks. We have our line from the tank and the regulator come all the way up and we're, we're just about ready to connect to the keg you'll notice that um, before we tested for leaks I was at 10 psi we're at 20 psi now I dialed it up a little bit more we still don't have any visible bubbles but the reason why I like to go up a little bit higher than this like 20 psi some people even go to 30 psi because now we're going to purge the headspace and also help seal the lid by putting an excess of pressure on top of the keg. So the way we're going to do that, and we're also going to purge for CO2, is the disconnect has this uh, collar on it. And when you lift it up, it releases the ball locks inside there, and it fits right down on the post. So I'll just throw the baby on here. And you can hear the CO2 running into the keg, hopefully on camera. <laughs> and you can hear it slowing down because we've filled the headspace and we sprayed the top of the keg just like we did the fittings with star sand yeah. and there was some bubbles but the lid has sealed there's no active bubbling so that's a good sign that the lid has sealed now we want to purge the co2 headspace by pulling up on the pressure relief valve and you'll hear the gas runs back in so i just do that three or four times get a really good this is called like burping the keg and you can like give it like a good two second burp and so you can hear the pressure kind of drops down as you release it. And that's you trying to replace the, head, the air with CO2. So I just do that three or four times until I feel pretty good about what we've done. So now we've 
checked for leaks, we're hooked up, and we've broke the keg. So we know we've got most of the air out of the keg. One more time. One more time. Excellent. So at this point, you'd be good to go. You could put this keg hooked up into the fridge at 20 PSI and start and expect within three to seven days you'd be carbonated. But 20 PSI is probably a little bit higher of a carbonation level than you want. So we're gonna dial this back down to about say 15 PSI or 12 PSI. And uh, by adjusting the screw with the screwdriver and then we'll burp again to get the excess head pressure out of there. And this is usually a little bit of trial and error. So, um, so now go ahead and release the pressure on the keg. You've loosened that up. So release the pressure and you'll see this will go down to probably, just keep going, just let it rip. Okay, so now we're down to zero. Now slowly turn this back up until you get to the desired pressure you want to carbonate at, which normally for me is like 12 to 15 PSI. So see as you slowly go, it's going to come up. And that's probably okay. pretty good right there. And the, it'll run in. The lid is still sealed. We don't have any active bubbles from the, the Star Sand solution up there. So at this setting, this is how you would expect to see like between 2.2 and 2.5 volumes of CO2 in the keg. And this is the set it, forget it method. You're ready to go. You put it in the fridge. It gets cold. The beer is already cold because John had cold crashed. So at this point, you're carbonating your first keg of beer. How about that? Woo. All right, well, that was uh, the culmination of the kegging project. We have uh, CO2 flowing into the keg to carbonate uh, the beer. And you said this is the set it and forget it? So, yeah, this set is the set it and forget it method. Mm -hmm. If for some reason, I think we've talked about this in some of our earlier kegging, video, kegging videos, if we were hosting an event tomorrow, let's say you brewed a beer two weeks ago and it's ready now, it's in the keg, and you want to serve it tomorrow for an event, we could dial that pressure up to say 30 PSI or higher, I don't usually go higher than 30, and we could slowly rock that keg mm. every, for about you know, 20 seconds every couple minutes, come back, you know, do something, come back, rock the keg, and then put on a sample line. You know, you're, you know, we're going to eventually hook up tubing with a picnic faucet and a, and a black ball lock, con ball lock connector, yep. and you could sample it every so many cycles of shaking and you'll f actually taste the progression of the carbonation coming up. And that's the rapid carb method. There's actually nothing wrong with that method. Um, shaking it, there's some people feel that, you know, when you shake the keg, you create foam. And the more foam you create, you can't create more foam later. You're always diminishing the foam mm. potential. That's a whole other topic. Mm. Okay. Um, but the only thing is you can overshoot, which yeah. isn't really a big deal because you can just dial the pressure back down, burp the keg a few times, come back, burp it and get the pressure back down. But if you really want to go fast, 30 PSI, shake the keg, sample, shake the keg, sample, until you're at the right carbonation. Nothing then, wrong with sampling. Then set it back to your line pressure of 12 or 15 PSI, because if you leave it at 30, it's going to creep back up yeah. overnight. Yeah. Um, but then you'd be ready to go. I like set it and forget it, because you know what? I got other things to do. Yeah. I don't want to sit here and rock a keg. So into the fridge, serving pressure, and you just got one keg. If you had like six kegs coming off of a manifold, yeah then set it and forget it makes a lot more sense because you would just plug it into somewhere on your manifold and put it in there and then come back a week later and you'd be ready to go. All right. Well, thank you. Now I may never bottle again. Yeah. That's not true. But I'll certainly have, you know, beers that I want to have um, as house beers. Certainly that Vienna Lager will probably be in a keg at some point in the near future. Mm -hmm. This is my spring fling. It's an it's a American pale ale. Uh, 20 minutes was the first bittering charge. I used my homegrown uh, magnum hops in the freezer from last uh, year's harvest. And then all the, the, the hops that we did smash beers over like the past, uh, I don't know, 12 months or something like that, I had extra packets of. So I'll post the recipe, but I uh, had some Equinox in there, I think Mosaic, I think Sorachi Ace, um, one other, El Dorado, that was the other thing that I threw in there too. And then I dry hopped with some more Equinox because that is some pungent stuff right there. Anyway, uh, we'll let this sit, set and forget for a week. Then I'll set up this. I'll uh, take a sample. But we'll do it on camera so you can taste along with us. And who knows, maybe we'll share it. I don't know. 
Um, anyway, Regina Mike, BrewDashDudes.com. Hope you found this helpful. Certainly I did. Uh, kind of opened up a whole new world of uh, beer preparation, at least from my perspective. So hopefully it uh, helps you to get into kegging sooner rather than later. Um, brew on. Cheers.